In this episode of the Beamable Game Dev Podcast, I sit down with Jack from Odd Bug Studios, and we talk about launching a game on all the platforms. Let's jump into the interview. Jack, how's it going? Hello, how are you today? It's going well for me. Excited to be here. You, you've got a game on the cusp of launching. Yes, <laughs> it's scary. Two weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> After like almost three years of working on it, it's, it's super close. So yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> kind of scary. The look on your face was uh, it kind of kind of said it all right there. So, <laughs> well, let's uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and and how you got into the industry and and maybe what's what's inspired you. Yeah. So, um, I'm Jack. I'm the producer designer at Oddbug Studio. Um, I, we founded Oddbug to like three of us from university. So we, me, Dan and Martin all went to university together. We studied game design in Norwich in the UK. And then after university, we went to Dare to be Digital in Scotland, which is like a competition for students. They get like a month to put together a demo of the game. And whilst we was doing that, Sony came and visited and checked out all the games and they really liked what we made. So we started talking to them about Lost Bear, which was our first game. We showed them like our concept documents and everything, and they really liked it and loved it. So they gave us some funding to make a demo of that. And that's really what got us into the industry because from there we was able to hire like programmers and uh, some sound guys. Uh, and that's really what gave Oddbug Studio its life was that first interaction with Sony and, and making the demo for Lost Bear. And since then, obviously we've, released Lost Bear into the world. That came out on PSVR in 2016, 2017, somewhere around there. Uh, and then since then, we've been uh, working on Towers of Iron. So yeah, it's been uh, like eight years of game dev. <laughs> I, I, I love hearing this. Like, what, what was that like for you, having Sony chat with you guys while at university? I mean, <laughs> you had to have kind of just been like, like in shock. It, yeah it was it was kind of wild because we were just showing them like the game kind of thinking like oh yeah they'll, they'll give us some nice feedback on it and and that was it but then when they was like because we were just getting drunk with them at the time as well which was kind of fun but uh, <laughs> they, they they was like yeah yeah like we would love it we, we could definitely see this it was sony x dev so they was like at the time giving funding to a lot of indie devs it was that kind of like indie boom so just to be going straight from university where like we'd made demos to suddenly being like, all oh, right, we're making an actual game now. Let's start, I guess. <laughs> so that was kind of intense to go from that like student to straight into industry. But it was, it was a fun journey. It was really exciting. So that, it was it was nice that period of time. So it sounds like the tips I'm picking up are keep the liquor handy <laughs> if uh, if some of these big publishers show up. <laughs> it's always fun it, it loosens everyone's lips and purse strings i guess a little bit <laughs> <laughs> that is that is incredible that that is so cool to hear what uh what what games are you currently playing anything you got a game launched in two weeks you playing much games or are you uh well, just working all the time i mean other than tales of iron yeah uh well last weekend stupidly i started the witcher 3 again so that was like Here's my time sink for the next like six months. So like uh, I'm up to the bloody baron now. So I'm doing I'm doing all right. But yeah, like The Witcher 3 is probably one of my favorite games ever. But in terms of other games, I'm playing like I played Out of Worlds for a little bit. I was playing Battle Brothers on Steam quite a lot, which was really nice. Uh, and then on my Switch, I've become like kind of addicted to Pokemon Unite, which I don't know why it's so addicting because it infuriates me. To no end, but uh, I play that a lot in the mornings and probably Kingdoms Two Crowns as well. I play a lot of that, which is nice. If you were to pick like a favorite indie game, what would you go with? Uh, I really like Sword and Sanctuary. That was really good, but that, I mean, that's quite old now. Hollow Knight, obviously, but they're, they're just two games that I've played a lot for like references and inspiration for Tales of Iron. So they're not such it's something that I play directly like that but i would say maybe kingdoms two crowns is a game that i keep coming back to i really really enjoy that i mean it's got an amazing art style they keep dropping dlcs for it it's just a really easy game for you to drop in and feel like you're achieving something and mm. you can actually see your kingdom being built out which is quite nice so yeah i do really enjoy kingdoms two crowns 
Very cool. Let's, you've mentioned Tales of Iron a few times. <laughs> what is it? Where'd the idea come from? Let's just start, let's just start chatting about, about your game. <laughs> so Tales of Iron, my easiest way for me to explain it to someone new is I normally say it's like Red Bull meets the, the Witcher. So think this sort of like anthropomorphic animals in this medieval sort of kingdom. Uh, and it's all driven by this story. So you play as Reggie the Rat, who is the new king of the rat kingdoms when it's attacked by the frogs. And then that leads into this situation where your brothers have been taken by the frogs and they've taken over a lot of your settlement. So you've kind of got to go out, defeat the frogs, rescue your brothers, rebuild your kingdom, and then take the fight to the frogs. So it's this sort of classic hero's journey in this like lovingly hand-painted 2D world with lots of layers and parallax effect. Uh, and then that's underpinned by like this really hard 2D Souls-like combat that also takes some inspiration from like God of War with the different colored attacks. Uh, and then it, on top of that, it just is super, super brutal, like heads getting chopped off, arms coming off, guts spewing, which is something a lot of people don't really expect because you see from the outside this like cutesy little rat getting about with a sword and shield, and then you start to realize, oh, wow, <laughs> there's a lot of blood in this game. This is no joke. <laughs> Where did the idea come from? Where did the story come from? So the funny thing about it is like, obviously the main characters, they're all rats and that's based on the director's pet rats. So he had, he had like six real pet rats that he kept. And so they're all, all of the main rat characters are based on his pets and Reggie was his favorite one. That's why he became the main character. Then obviously like we wanted to create this sort of medieval fantasy world. So we had the rats being like almost like these European knights. And we wanted sort of a more goblin, you know, like fantasy trope of an enemy to, battle against you and the frogs obviously lead straight into this sort of goblin orc looking character so that was a really nice moment to bring those two together and and then put that backstory of them being at war behind that this i i i love it i love it so is this i mean you said he had he had pet rats <laughs> then there <laughs> and reggie was the favorite <laughs> <laughs> That's why he becomes. That's why he becomes the king. <laughs> that is so great. How has the, you guys have been at this for three years, right? Yeah, well, yeah, just almost, yeah, three years. And the game's going to launch on all all platforms. Correct. Yeah, yeah. How has that process been working with all the with all the the different platforms? I mean, the way we built the game is that we made sure that everything was running on Switch because obviously Switch being the, the, the handheld version, we knew that if it ran on Switch pretty well, then it was going to run very well on like PS4, PS5 and all of the Xboxes and obviously PC as well. So we built everything focused around the Switch so that then we could, if we had the space, we could upscale things with PS4 and, and Xbox. So Handling that way kind of took a lot of the stress off. We didn't have to deal with loads of uh, different platforms, but obviously eventually you start getting platform specific bugs and issues that you have to fix, but it's been pretty smooth to be fair. It hasn't been as as uh, chaotic as I was expecting it to be, which I'm, I'm glad about. And then obviously with the PS5 and that as well, you get all of the nice triggers. So it's been, it's been a pretty cool experience. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that? Like you are, you've got the the adaptive triggers are going to work in your game. Yeah, so we've just done a little bit with base because obviously with it being Souls like you've got weight, so different weighted weapons have different speeds of attack and like the resistance on that. And when you're parrying an enemy, you've got different weight resistances depending on the enemy. So yeah, there's a little bit of that in there. Um, I think in the future we'll probably go into that a lot more because like I'd like to do things with like the, the vibration with like feeling the rain and feeling the wind as you're walking through certain areas. So yeah, in the future I'll definitely be uh, looking at that a bit more. That's, that's super cool. I like that you guys said you, you basically built this around the switch yeah. so that it scaled for everything else very easily versus, you know, getting everything looking amazing on like the series X or PC and then, and then trying to compress it down to the switch. Exactly. That, that to me sounds, I mean, it sounds brilliant, honestly, because it's going to, 
as long as everything goes as planned, I mean, you're going to be looking, you're going to be rocking and rolling every platform. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, the switch is a powerhouse when it comes to indie titles and, and the, just the way that community eats up, eats up games like this. So that that's, that's great to hear that, yeah. that as a huge switch fan, I'm just like, okay, all right. So it sounds like this game's going to be great no matter where you pick it up. Yeah. That, that was the thing with it. Like from a development point of view, we didn't want to make it be like, this is amazing. Look at all these assets and all of these lights that we can use on PS5. And then it'd be like, and now eyes, please go through and delete half of the work you've done. Because it's just super depressing, isn't it? That it's not as good as it can be. So if we can make it as good as it can be for P- for the Switch, then obviously we can add more to take up that extra headroom that we've got on, on PS4 and PS5 and the Xboxes. So yeah, it was just a it was just a simple way to work, I guess. <laughs> As as you're developing games right now, and and the way the state of the industry as far as like you know Switch being a, kind of an underpowered tablet compared to the other systems, like was there? I, I don't know if regret is the is the word like getting it out on the Switch, or do you feel like? you were it was it was powerful enough that you didn't have to like cut too much stuff out of the out of the overall game yeah no I, the, the switch was definitely powerful enough and I, I think for us it was that aspect of we all grew up with the nintendo so we wanted we wanted to be on a nintendo platform and nintendo's just got this weird thing for us or for most developers i would imagine that like it is that childhood console so you want to be on it no matter what and like I say, I feel like, yes, it is the weaker one, but we we could add more on the other platforms. Like we could increase fog, we could increase light. So it wasn't like we it's not better on other platforms. It just allowed us to work in a, in a way that was more cohesive to cutting them all out rather than having to cut everything back and yeah. just be horrible, horrible development process. Yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant. I'm, I, I love hearing it. So the, uh, I mean, you've been you've been developing games over the last like eight years. What are what are some of the changes that you've seen over the years? I I don't know, like because being indie, you you are kind of insular. Like we're based in Manchester in the UK, and there's quite a big indie community. Like Death Store came out of here, Overcooked came out of here, Recompile came out of Manchester. You know, so there are big indie devs here. So we don't really get that massive flow of like how triple A's are changing. But something that's been quite interesting this year, specifically because of COVID, is how indies have been taking up the place of traditional AAA positions. Like September is normally that like no go. We're not nobody comes out in September because this is where the big boys come out. And then this year, when you look at like Gamescom and E3, and I mean, there's a game coming out like every day this week. I feel like it. So I feel like indies have kind of moved into that spot of not just being the indie games, but they are a legitimate a legitimate game for you to play rather than it having to be, you know, the next big triple A title. They've really moved like and, and not that they ever were, but like I think they were kind of viewed as filler, right? Yeah. For in between triple A's. And that's not yeah. I, I know a, there's a lot of people that just play indies exclusively just because yeah. there's so much and the quality is so great that in some cases it feels like like the the old days of like you know, I mean, Nintendo used to have to work within the restraints of the systems, right? Yeah. And you you have in some cases companies doing that. I mean, you look at like like Yacht Club with Shovel Knight, and they were like, "We're only going to work with this color palette, and we're only you know." And so, but then that would that would push them and push the creativity and stuff. And so, yeah. it's, I, uh, I, I think the thing that proves my point is like every time a Nintendo or uh, direct comes up it's always where's hollow knight where's hollow knight where's it's not like yes. where's the next mario where's the next zelda it's always hollow knight hollow knight cannot be mentioned and on twitter you'll see hollow knight <laughs> trending underneath the nintendo direct just because yeah. it's hollow knight so i think that's proven that you know indies have moved into that space where they they can be the blockbuster if that's the you know the right term yeah and i mean how great i mean we're even seeing it like like right now i mean look at like Splitgate. That game has just kind of been like, it just all of a sudden, everybody's playing it. Fall Guys, Among Us, right? Like you yeah. saw, I mean, 
I feel like Nintendo was scrambling to make sure that they were first to get among us on the yeah. uh, on the Switch, you know. Definitely. And it, it's, I mean, it's such a popular title, and it's it's so it's so it's just a simple a, a simple game, and I and I love I love their story too, right? Where it was like like yeah. they were kind of like, well, I guess we've time to start on the next project or whatever, and all of a sudden, boom, like. Yeah. It must have been so wild for them to suddenly be like, "Oh wow, there's people actually like going crazy over our game." It must have been such a such a roller coaster of emotions. So that yeah, it's pretty cool for them to be doing that. And like you say, Nintendo is literally the perfect space for indies. You can pick it up, play for like an hour on the train, or you know, whilst before you go to bed, and it's just there. You put it down, and it's done. There's no like faffing around with it. Yeah, I love it. It's good. The first time I was introduced to uh, Tales of Iron was during an Xbox presentation. Tell yeah. me what it was like for you watching that presentation and then seeing your game on the screen. Yeah, so we was included in like that roundup of the month, which is, you know, it's an Xbox. It's insane that we're being included in that. So it was really cool to see us amongst these big tiles. It was like, like Papa, Papa Xbox has noticed us, you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that moment that this, because we're only like a six man team. We're a six man team that works over Discord. So for us to suddenly be on this big platform and people seeing it was was kind of wild. And it, like the other day, Sony PlayStation tweeted out the game and then Shu Yoshida was talking about it. And it's just like, this is absolutely wild. Like we're just these small little indie dev we shouldn't be having <laughs> these big names being like look at this game it's good <laughs> but, i mean like that even it even comes down to like because the game the whole game is narrated by doug cockle who plays gail Rivia from the witcher games mm-hmm. so he's narrating throughout the game so that was another moment like during development where we was just like like oh my god <laughs> this big actor like Geralt, who we know as this big star that we was like he's not gonna want to work with us He's, we're just a small indie team. He's Gail or Rivia. He's a badass. He's not going to want to come and play, like, talk to us. But he, yeah, he got on board. He loved it. And like, that was just another one of those moments. Like, wow, we've actually got that guy working with us. It's cool. <laughs> well, it sounds like it, it sounds like he's a, a good fit too with the style of the game and how you were talking about how it's pretty brutal. I mean, I know The Witcher can be pretty brutal, you know, like <laughs> well, that. That's, that's the thing. As soon as you hear his voice, you just, you know that you're going to be in for this like dark, fantasy adventure that's going to have like you say these gruesome turn like times in it so having his voice over the top of it is just yeah it was just perfect it fitted the game perfectly and it was also a dream of ours to work with Geralt so it it ticked both boxes so as as other devs are listening to this they're probably wondering how did you go about getting him to come and do the the vo for you yeah well that that was the thing like we uh, we was discussing with the publisher like oh we we should add a narrator because we all of our stories told through these bubbles that have like animated imagery inside them but we wanted to make sure that everyone got the story so we'd have a narrator kind of describe what's going on over the top of that and so obviously that led to the conversation of like who do we want and we was like we would very much like Geralt if <laughs> that's a possibility at all and the publisher was just like okay cool don't worry about it we'll go sort it out and. They showed him the game. He loved the game. And yeah, he was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm on board. And he, he's so nice. Like, he's, he's just really lovely. Like, when you're working with him, he's complete. He's not like, I'm Geralt Rivia. I know what I'm doing. He's like full on happy to work with you, redo stuff. And he's such a pro that he just smashes through it. And then you've got like half hour where you're just sitting there chatting with him asking him what it was like to record the unicorn scene you know (laughs) it was was very very weird situation but pretty cool yeah was it was it an an email that you got that said hey he's on board or was it a phone call like yeah the publisher just told us like yep gerald as well doug's on board he's happy to go for it we're going to be recording here and here awesome nice were were you were you guys speechless were you just kind of like (laughs) like what, what, like the first thing we did is we called like Dan Dan's brother who is uh, like a big Witcher fan so we called him up and like yeah we've got Geralt in the game and it's just like this wild moment of being like no nah, that can't be possible so <laughs> it's just a, it was just a really cool moment yeah nice. I, I love it that's that's <laughs> awesome so as an as an indie developer what what's one of the biggest lessons that you've learned um I would say 
do not wait for your game to come out before starting the next game. The, the issue we ha- we always worked out, or the, unfortunately we fell into the trap of, our first game came out and we was like, yep, this is it. It's going to make money and we use that money to make the next game. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's not how it works. You end up being in a position where you're like having to get another job to support yourself and like while you're trying to make this demo because most publishers want you to have a demo to be able to explain what your game is going to be like, but nobody is giving out funding for that demo. So you're in this kind of catch-22 situation where you need to spend like six, seven months making a demo to prove your point and the quality bar that you want to get to, but you've also got to pay everyone for that time. And if your last game's finished and you haven't got you haven't got the funds, basically. It's just yeah. business. It's just not it's not pleasant. So I we, we we always try and work on the next title, get together a pitch document, see what we can use from the game we've got to kind of put together some sort of demo to start pitching as you're finishing the game. And I know that's like absolutely insane because you are so focused on the um on the game you're currently releasing, but if you don't do that and your game isn't a major success and pays you back because most of the time your game, even if it is a success, it takes three months before any platform holders start handing out money. They only give it out every quarter. So you are still going to be in that situation where you haven't got money coming in. So you need to be out and selling your wares, basically, as uh, as horribly businessy as that is. It's <laughs> unfortunately a fact. It, it is. I mean, it is the way it is. And this is great information, honestly, because it, I mean, you said it yourself, you guys released your first one and you were like, all right. And then it's <laughs> like, Oh, wait a minute. You know? yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, and it's also, it's also good to, you know, n- know these things going into it because it, you, you can't like you, your mindsets to get this game launched. Yeah. But you're also thinking about that next one because you got to keep the you got to keep the food on the table. You got to keep the bills paid. Well, that's exactly it. Like when you're coming to the end of a game, you are completely focused on thinking this game's going to come out and it's going to stop the world and everyone's going to want to play it. Nobody wants to play your game. <laughs> like, there's so many games coming out that you have got you've got to be prepared for the situation where it doesn't smash it. I mean, fingers crossed for everyone making a game that it does, but. You've got to be prepared for that situation. I know it's really hard to think of that because you put so much love and attention and detail into the game that you're making, but you've got to be prepared, not just for yourself and the company, but if you've got employees, these you have a, a like a duty to these people, you know, yeah. you've got to, you've got to be ready for them. So we were talking beforehand a little bit and you've been, this is like your second podcast you've you spent a bunch of time doing doing press tell me a little bit about that like have you had to get out of a comfort zone and were you expecting to kind of like be doing these interviews and 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 getting you know getting a little more in the limelight and then and it's i mean it's almost necessary to help more more eyes get on the game at this point yeah like it's not something you uh or well, for me anyway, it wasn't something I grew up thinking like, I want to make games and I want to be like a face that people see. Like that wasn't something that was particularly a thing I wanted to do. But yeah, you, you need to be talking about it. Like I say, there's so many games coming out, you need to be out there and talking about it. But in terms of doing like the press previews and that sort of thing, it was <laughs> the crazy thing about it was we were showing people like the first hour of the game. So they were playing through and then I was talking to them as they were playing it and telling them why we made certain decisions, that sort of thing. But that first hour of the game is what we would always play to test all of the mechanics. So I've played that bit about a million times. (laughs) (laughs) So I've played it a million times. And then in press previews, it's like I'm not playing it. I'm watching it now and I'm watching it 10 times a day back to back. So like it's hard to be in that position where you're like happy and excited and buzzing for it, but that's kind of where you've got to be to to make people see what you see from the game, I guess. So it's not something that I wanted to do, but I do quite enjoy it. It's quite fun. As you as you would watch people play, would you see them do like do things that you're like, oh, I, I we didn't expect that, or we didn't see we haven't, we haven't seen somebody do that before, or did were you experiencing that? Well, with our game, it was like where it's so hard, we was expecting people to die a lot more. So when we got someone that was like really good and like 
I think we had maybe like 20, 30 people play it and we had like one person that made it the whole way through without dying. So when I saw that, it was like, wow, that, that you got, you were smashing it. But the, the thing I do like about it is where it's so hard, I just get to laugh at people dying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the enjoyable thing is just seeing journalists like die and die and die. And that was quite fun. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you this. Have you guys done much content uh, for the game, like, like, like social media marketing and things like that? Or is it mostly, is it mostly your publisher that's, that's focused on that stuff? Uh, the publishers that like handling all the market and the PR, but we do make our own trailers. Um, we make all of the, the art assets and that sort of thing. We just, uh, the publisher kind of handles how that's dealt with because, I do not have a clue how that sort of stuff works. <laughs> it is most definitely a whole other team's job on its own to uh, control that sort of thing. So I'm more than happy for them to do that. <laughs> for sure. Can we talk a little bit about just the process of of getting in contact with the publisher and how you guys worked out your deal? You don't have to yeah. go into like details you can't talk about, obviously, but just like just sure. as I try to I try to shape this towards people that are like maybe making those first steps and they're like, well, how, how do I get a publisher? What, what are the, what are the steps to take? Okay. Yeah, cool. So um, the way we did it, I mean, it's game dev, it's completely different for everyone, but the way it worked for us was there was an event in Birmingham in the UK called EGX, which is like a big gaming event. I think it's the biggest one in the UK. And there were, there's like this like speed dating sort of thing where there's like maybe 10, 12 publishers and you book in and then if the publisher like if the publisher swipes right, then they're like, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a meeting with you. And then uh, <laughs> you get to, you get like a 10, 15 minute slot and you sit down and you, you pitch a game, you show them your demo, you talk about like what you want to do with the game, what, the, what they want to do, what they see, where they see their publisher going basically. So um, we went to EGX, we had a video of the demo, we had a, um, some like concept art and a game pitch document. So they were all separate things, but basically we just showed them the video and then we did the pitch doc. And then we was like, if you want to see more, we've got a design document. We've got the demo that you could play. So it looked from a, a publisher's point of view, like we were ready to go. Like it wasn't just, here's a demo. Like we have got documentation. We're ready to pitch. We are a professional outfit. We're not just turning up. We are saying we made it the weekend. So, um, you do that, you pitch like back to back to like 10, 12 publishers. And then from there, we was like lucky enough that we had a few that were interested. United Label, our current publisher being one of them. And then from there, it's just discussing terms, discussing ideas, working for a contract and coming to an agreement. My going back to your previous question about ideas, always make sure you keep your IP. That's another that's another one I would say, which United Labour are completely fine with. So yeah, keep your IP. That's good. I mean, that's great advice. Yeah. The so I mean the prep going into these, like you guys went to an event, but the prep was video of the demo. Yeah. Some assets and, and uh concept art, and then uh the the pitch. Yeah. Right. And did you guys did you guys come up with the pitch yourself? Did you get any help from from any outside source on that? No, we did the pitch completely ourselves. So like our basic breakdown of the pitch was like X statement. Boom. This is me telling you the game in 10 words, two sentences. Like, here's exactly what the game is. Red Bull meets Witcher. Boom. And then next page would be a bit more detail on the story, the gameplay that you want to go into and then giving examples of here's three games that it's like we're taking the combat from Witcher, we're taking the side scrolling action from sword and sanctuary and we're taking the world exploring from hollow knight so that somebody that has not played your game yet has kind of got a concept of what they want then we'd break down into more detail like here's our story and characters that's what people that's what people are first going to get into here's concept art of the world here's how the gameplay works Here's where we see ourselves in the market. So we would just do like a, a basic axes and be like, here's Hollow Knight. It's an action adventure over here. Here's Dark Souls. It's more about the combat and then place games like yours around that, that um, axes and then show where yours is. And hopefully yours is in a slot that's slightly more open than everyone else. So you can prove that you think you found a gap in the market. And then from there, we went down into like, 
here's how much money we need. This is how the team's broken down. Here, here's the main people that are going to be in charge. And then the final thing was a, a graph, which was in a separate document, but a Gantt, like a Gantt chart of here's how the project would break down. Here's when we need certain amounts of money, all of that good business stuff. <laughs> all of that good <laughs> business stuff. Indeed. <laughs> I love it. Jack, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and, and talking about the, the business side of things. Like it's a real, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of this. It's part of making it, making the dream a reality. Right. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate your time. Tell us again, uh, where we can find song of iron when it's releasing, please plug away. So Tales of Iron comes out on the 17th of September, and that is on Xbox, both Xboxes, both PlayStation, Switch, and Steam. Uh, like I said, that'll be the 17th of September, and we are tweeting about it constantly, so please follow us at, at our Bug Studio. I think I said the wrong name. I meant Tales of Iron. Please forgive me. <laughs> There's a lot of games coming out, is what I'm saying. There, there is, and I think there is a Song of Iron, so Tales of Iron. So forgive me on that one, but, uh, um, yeah, thanks again. This has been, this has been a, a, a great, just, just so much information. And, uh, I look forward to, to playing the game and, uh, maybe I'll hit you up in a, you know, a couple weeks or a month. We'll talk about how things are going and, yeah, and, uh, yeah, go from there. Awesome. So thanks again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Beamable Game Dev Podcast. If you'd like to get into the conversation with other devs, head on over to Beamable.com slash Discord. And if you'd like to learn more about Beamable, head on over to Beamable.com.